Thank you, Patsy and Monet, for sharing that special gift, especially since it is, uh, it is Indigenous Peoples Sunday. So it is a Sunday where we, we celebrate uh, the folks who, who are indigenous to America. Let us pray. Gracious and holy God, we thank you for this day, for this, this moment, this time, to sit with Scripture, to be present with you. By your Spirit, grant us eyes that see, ears that hear, and hearts that are transformed. In Jesus' name, amen. So in this Easter season, we are spending some time turning towards a, a practical matter of faith. We had fun during the season of Lent, playing around in Broadway songs and in scripture, reflecting on the, the joy of connecting things that aren't inherently Christian with, with the wonder and depth of God's love for us. But in this season, as we journey towards Pentecost, we're, we're wrestling with prayer, what it means to pray, what we pray, who we pray for, why we pray, how we pray. The list goes on, and I constantly leave at least three or four of them out. I think where we pray is going to be a really fun one. That'll be interesting. Uh, but throughout this time, we're, we're taking some, some Sundays to reflect both on Scripture and our, our lives of prayer. That's in part because in the, the Jesus in America study that was done at the tail end of 2021, the second highest way that people feel grounded in their, in their relationship with God, their spiritual life, is prayer. The first was being outdoors, and music was way too far down on the list for Wendell's liking. So, um, but we're, we're going to lean into prayer. Last week we tackled why we pray, that, that leaning into God's vision rather than our own, that, that seeking of hope, the, the varied reasons that all of us turn to God in different moments, whether it's for thanksgiving or to offer up a concern of our hearts. Today we find ourselves before the question of how. How do we pray? Now, I don't know about you, uh, has anybody ever felt uncertain or uncomfortable about praying? Uh, I have. Fun fact for you. There, some, some moments it just feels awkward. Other moments it takes a lot of time getting used to. It took way too long for me to get comfortable praying in front of people to have to do it as much as I do now. Uh, I'm not sure why that was the case. It was just a very uncomfortable space. It was, it was something that I personally did not always enjoy. As someone who grew up in the life of the church, prayer for the longest part of time, the longest chunk of my life, was the most boring part of worship. I couldn't stand it. We had, we had great pastors growing up. One of, one of the associate pastors that I grew up with God bless him, much like Ron, uh, our beloved associate pastor, uh, wrote the most beautiful prayers. They were so thoughtful and so well written. But as a kid doing this and just listening to somebody say a prayer, I, I couldn't stand it. It was so dull. And it was just the reality of it. it. It did not matter how well written the prayer was. They just, it didn't hold my attention. I was too antsy. I wanted to play tic-tac-toe with my brothers, which we did a lot. Um, when it came to the Lord's Prayer, it was, it was kind of similar. It wasn't something that captivated my attention growing up. In fact, more often than not, I felt like in the room where we were gathered in the sanctuary, as we, as we got to that point and we began to recite the Lord's Prayer, it felt monotonous and hollow. It was the words that everybody was saying all at once, which part of the reason it sounds the way it does is that's group speaking dynamics. When we all try to say the same thing at the same time, that's how it works. We get very monotone and we get very rhythmic with it. So I, I saw the Lord's Prayer as something that was just there. It was part of the routine. There wasn't anything particularly special about it to me. And for the longest time, that was the case. I, I sat with it wondering how on earth it could be so meaningful when it sounded like we were all bored to tears when we would pray it. I didn't know at that point in time that it was something drawn from the Gospels. 
Even though I had heard again and again that reminder of let us pray the prayer that, that, that Jesus taught us. I had never gone back and read the passages where Jesus actually, actually shared that prayer with the disciples. And there's some cool stuff in there. So one of the fun things about having the different Gospels is how they speak into different moments and offer up different, uh, different contexts for what happens and unfolds. Now, the Lord's Prayer doesn't show up in John's Gospel. John's Gospel doesn't have anything to do with it. But it first shows up in Mark's Gospel. The catch is, it only shows up as the forgive us our, our sins, forgive us our wrongdoings as we forgive others. That, that important piece of the forgiveness that we ask for from God being, being the same forgiveness that, that we are willing to offer other people. Forgive me as I forgive others. In Matthew's gospel, in Matthew's gospel, Jesus offers this, this beautiful prayer that, that has become the version that we use to, to make the framework for the Lord's prayer that we say in churches today. Matthew's gospel, the context for it, though, is, is, is squirrely. If you've ever wondered whether or not somebody was thinking that, that as you came up to pray in front of everybody, you just are wanting attention, anybody ever felt like that might be what somebody's thinking? Okay, pastoral hazard. There we go. All right. Uh, well, that's, that's the context for, for Jesus sharing this prayer in Matthew's gospel. He's, he's, he's talking to his disciples and the, and the people gathered around them, around him, and he's sharing that, you know, don't, don't pray for the attention that it will get you. You should pray to, to seek God and be in the presence of God, not, not to gain accolades or reputation with, with the people around you. The motivations aren't, aren't there. It's not the, not, not the reason to be praying. A fun story about that that's a sidebar that I probably shouldn't go down is, is a fun note. The, the best place where I've ever seen how this plays out is not in local churches. It was in seminary. And I'm telling all my classmates and myself when I tell this story. See, in, in seminary, you're, you're in classes with all these people that want to become clergy, that want to be pastors, which means that there's a bit of competition among some of us. I, that may sound silly to you, but it happens. So when we get into a moment of prayer and we start, we start uh, in a class or in a small group sharing in some time in prayer, Aaron may actually have heard this and be painfully aware of what I'm about to talk about. You can be in the middle of a, a moment of prayer and, and there, the competition piece, the, the accolades of the people around you, uh, we all grew up Methodists or uh, Anglicans or Episcopalians in that, in that class. There were very few Baptists and very few Pentecostals. So we were a bit uncomfortable with the idea of saying amen or yes, Lord, in the middle of somebody's prayer. We didn't like the interruptions. It was supposed to be silent. So for some reason, the most comfortable thing for us to do was groan. <laughs> it, yeah. Yep. So uh, in the midst of a prayer, you know you were, you were saying the right things. You were hitting the right points. If, if it sounded like somebody had eaten a piece of a chocolate bar and they had been like abstaining from chocolate for a year, because all of a sudden in the room you'd hear, mmm. <laughs> Amen would have been much less silly in that space. But, but that, that, sort of, that sort of moment that that for all the, the good intentions could offer the temptation of, I'm, I'm going to keep leaning into this prayer, trying to get as many of those responses as I can, rather, simply, rather than simply being present with God, rather than, than offering up the, the prayer that was upon our hearts uh, with, with good intentions. And that's not to say that everybody in seminary, when they pray, falls prey to that uh, that temptation, that desire, but it's to openly acknowledge, I know I felt it at different times. The affirmation, oh man, to know, I, you know, this is a good prayer, I'm doing the right thing, was, was so affirming that it then became the temptation of, I want to be the one that gets the most groans. Yeah. See, when we, when we look at 
the, the context, Matthew, that's, that's, what, that's what Jesus is addressing in, in Matthew. But Luke, I know we didn't read it from Luke today. We read it from Matthew because it's closest to the Lord's Prayer, and that's what I wanted us to sit with. The context for Luke has the best context of all the other, the other Gospels for this prayer. See, in Luke's Gospel, Jesus has that little discourse about what is, what is good prayer, what's appropriate prayer, don't you know, use it for the wrong reasons, that kind of thing. But then there's this moment where Jesus is, has gone off on his own like he usually does, and he has a time of prayer. And when he, when he finishes up his time of prayer, the disciples have taken notice, and they look at Jesus, and they offer up this, this request, Lord, teach us to pray. Because like many of us, they enter into that conversation about prayer and how they should pray with, with the same sense of uncertainty that we may carry. And they, they have that question, how do we pray? We want to pray like you are, Jesus. How? How do we do that? That's when Jesus offers this, this, this prayer, this wonderful occasion, this prayer that touches on so much of, of the, the realities of what we need and what we are called to lean into. Now, I find a lot of comfort in, in the reality that the disciples ask that question, Lord, teach us to pray, because it reminds me that even the people who walked alongside Jesus still were uncertain about what to do and how to do it. Maybe that gives you some, some comfort. The other, the other piece that I love about it is, is the reminder that, that, that we continually learn and, and grow, that we're given this tremendous gift of, of, a, of a prayer that, that when all other words fail, it is something that we can rely on, because it's a prayer that leans into the most basic things about our lives as, as people who follow Jesus. An acknowledgement of, of seeking God's kingdom rather than our own visions and desires, a, a request for, for the things that we need in our daily life, the bread that we need for today, not tomorrow, but, but this, this moment that we're in. And then that forgiveness piece, because we are a people of reconciliation, of community and connection, of life together, that doesn't always mean that, that, that we're happy and, and, and happy to be around one another and always loving, but it means that, 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 we, that we abide with one another with intentionality. So this prayer becomes a prayer that gives us words when, when our own words may fail. And by the way, just like the song Amazing Grace pops up in random moments, uh, as, a, as a pastor, I've seen moments where, where families have lost loved ones, and, and for, for whatever reason, this prayer being the one that they know is, is the prayer that they end up praying, because they don't know what else to say in that moment. But this, this, is, this is familiar. It's comfortable. But the real neat thing about this question, how do we, how do, how do we pray? The neat thing about it is there's, no, there's not just one answer to how do we pray. The, the Lord's Prayer is a tremendous gift that gives us something if we don't know what else to do. But, but there are all sorts of other ways for us to pray. Sometimes the, the formal ones like the Lord's Prayer, the, the, the prayers that are in our communion liturgy as we go before the, the table that Jesus opens to all people, those are, are comfortable ones, and they're, they're the right ones for the right moment. Sometimes they're the, the, the less formal ones, but the really memorized ones. Uh, if, you, if you ever listen to my children at bedtime or at dinner time, you'll hear the same two prayers uh, every day. Uh, if you're lucky at dinner time, they're not going to race each other to see who can finish it first. In nighttime, it's the... Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. Guide me safely through the night and wake me with the morning light. Familiar? Easy, simple prayers. That just offer and make space and room for that, that time to be set aside. Sometimes the, the less formal prayers are, are helpful. 
whether it's while you're, while you're taking a walk around the neighborhood, you're driving somewhere in your car, and, and you have that, that quote-unquote conversation with God. Anybody ever use that for their prayer life? Just talk to God in the car? Yeah, fair number of folks. Then there's other neat things that I, I will confess I did not learn about until I went to seminary, and there was time set aside to learn about them. Things like contemplative prayer, which in essence is sitting in silence for a prolonged period of time, just listening for the Spirit to speak. Uh, you would be amazed at how, how many folks get real uncomfortable with that real fast. Uh, try to sit in silence for five minutes doing nothing, just listening. Lectio Divina is, is another one where you just sit and, and listen to Scripture be read over and over and over again as you as you lend an ear to whatever words or phrases the spirit is inviting you to sit with to wrestle with that's another great one even even just taking a few moments to look at a work of art and to ponder like the windows in our sanctuary to ponder the the depth of god's grace the story that is told in those can be can be a time and an act of prayer. See, there's so much variety to how we can lean into the work of praying with one another, for one another. And, and it's as varied as our personalities are, and, and, and there are, there's just tremendous opportunity for us to, to grow and learn as we, as we wrestle with what prayer is, especially that question of how we pray. Ponder what some of your favorite ways of praying are, just for a moment. When you prayed last, not in the sanctuary, how did you do it? How did you pray? Was it in silence? Were you talking to God in your head? Was it a familiar prayer that you recite every day? During this Easter season, as we're as we're preparing ourselves for Pentecost and we're still celebrating the, the empty tomb, it's, it is a season to explore and try and learn new things. So at some point this week, try, a, try out a different way of praying. Find some way to explore a new way of, of connecting with God, of, of wearing thin that, that, uh, that sense of presence. Find some new way to explore that. And if you don't know of, of a way, Ron and I would happily share a couple of ideas with you. We talk about it enough and do it enough. Happy to share about it. And there's even a, a small group that's going to be starting uh, May 17th on, on Tuesday evenings that's going to delve into some of those contemplative uh, practices of prayer. So even if you, if you can't think of one, that, that, that would be a great opportunity for you to lean into it. After choir. After choir. Yes, it is after choir. You're welcome, Wendell. <laughs> the point is this. Jesus gives us a great starting point. But we're still called to pray. Whether that looks like reciting the Lord's Prayer whenever you feel a moment needs it, whether it means talking with God or sitting in silence for a time, find some way to, to lean into a, a new way of praying this week. And with that said, let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we thank you for the, the gift that is prayer, the space to be present with you, whether words are involved or it is simply silence. We are grateful for the gift that is the Lord's Prayer that offers us words when ours may fail. By your Spirit, inspire us to find some new way to connect with you this week. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, we pray. Amen.